So this is the second video in a series on our innate and adaptive immunity. Um, in the first video, we talked about our first line of defense, specifically the skin, and how the skin functions as both a mechanical and a, a chemical barrier to infection. Remember, when we talk about innate immunity, we're talking about immunity that's always turned on, always functioning, and is relatively nonspecific. It doesn't care if you're E. coli, if you're salmonella. Uh, if you're foreign, if you're non-self, it's going to do all it can to block you from getting in. So what we'll do now is we'll jump ahead to the mucous membranes and the normal microbiota and look at their roles in protecting us in a very non-specific way as our first lines of defense. And then a couple of random bits and pieces of mechanical and, and chemical barriers that fit in first line of defense um, but don't really have a separate subcategory of their own. Mucous membranes, when we talk about a membrane at the, the anatomy, human anatomy level, we're not talking about a cell membrane that's made of phospholipids, we're not talking about the bilayer. We're talking about a thin um, sheet of cells that are typically one layer thick, and they're protecting something that's behind them. So in this case, our, our gastrointestinal tract, our respiratory tract, and our urogenital tracts have contact with the outside world and therefore need to be protected. But they can't be so tough that there's no interaction with what they take in or what they put out. Think about your GI tract, for example. Imagine if <clears throat> the lining of your GI tract was as tough as the skin on the outside of your, your arm. You'd never be able to absorb anything, would you? So these are pretty vulnerable tissues and as such need to be protected. And so these mucous membranes are there to protect them. These are layers of cells that have um, typically ciliated cells mixed in with them. And the cilia are there to move mucus along to keep things out from vulnerable regions. But more importantly, they have goblet cells, and the goblet cells are secreting mucus. If you've ever seen those sticky traps for, for bugs, you know, for spiders or something like that in your house, that's really how this works. Everybody take a deep breath. As you breathed in, whatever particles were in the air made it pretty deep into your lungs. But fortunately, most of them got stuck on mucus in the mucous membranes, uh, lining everything. And then slowly but surely, those ciliated cells are going to move that mucus with all the little stuff they trap, all the little particles, microbes, dust, skin cells, whatever, and move it all the way up until it gets to your epiglottis. <coughs> Clear your throat. You can feel a little bit of mucus move up past the epiglottis. Then what's your first response? To swallow. And so we move it around the other side of the epiglottis. We push it down through the esophagus and into the stomach where it hits the acid and degrades. Okay, that's the idea of a mucous membrane. This is less formidable of a barrier than skin, as you can imagine. This is live cells immediately in contact uh, well with the mucus and then immediately in contact after that with, with uh, potentially with microbes. But they have to be less formidable of a barrier. And if it wasn't for the mucus, every breath you took, for example, you could inhale microbes that could then attach to um, to the, uh, the lining of your respiratory tract and, uh, and potentially get an infection. So they rely on mucus. You notice there's a difference between what I wrote at the top, mucous membranes, M-U-C-O-U-S, and mucus, M-U-C-U-S. M-U-C-O-U-S is an adjective. It's a type of membrane that produces M-U-C-U-S, a noun. That's the snotty, slimy stuff that comes out when we blow our nose, a very viscous, thick glycoprotein. And this is predominantly a mechanical barrier. Now, there are some chemical um, and even cellular barriers associated with it. Uh, all mucus, regardless of, of which membrane it's protecting, cont contains a variety of defensins. And in our last video, we, we said the defensins are proteins that non-specifically inhibit bacterial activity. Nasal mucus specifically also contains lysozyme. We talked about lysozyme earlier when we talked about our sweat. Uh, lysozyme is an anti-peptidoglycan enzyme and therefore very effective against gram-positive bacteria whose peptidoglycan is exposed. And then kind of like when we talked about the skin, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give a little hint to a second line of defense. Uh, dendritic cells again are integrated among mucous epithelial cells just like they are integrated among the living uh, dermal and epidermal cells uh, in our skin. So this would act as a second line of defense and more importantly than simply gobbling up pathogens, these phagocytic dendritic cells 
alert our adaptive immune system to a potential intruder and connect our innate system with our adaptive system, and we'll be bringing that full circle in a later video. So pause the video here for a minute and think through this question. How can a mucous membrane be both a barrier, like we just said, and the most common portal of entry, like we talked about a couple of weeks ago in class when we talked about the process of infection? If you remember, we said that our mucous membranes are the most common portal of entry. And yet here we're saying, well, this is a really important barrier. How can it be both? Go ahead and click pause and think that through. If you're watching the video with somebody, talk it through out loud. Okay, presumably <clears throat> you've uh, come up with all the answers to all the tough questions, and uh, we can continue with just a couple more slides. Now we've talked about microbial antagonism before. It has a very important um, an important role for our normal flora, possibly the most important role. Uh, this is where the presence of one microbe, usually bacteria, uh, impedes colonization by another microbe, uh, typically some sort of a pathogen, or at least that's what we're, how we're conceiving it in terms of uh, what we want to keep out. And if you remember, there are three main mechanisms. The primary mechanism is most likely competitive exclusion. When every niche is already filled, stray microbes don't have a chance to establish themselves. There's also altered conditions. Uh, think about vaginal lactobacilli and candida and the pH of the female vaginal tract. Um, think about oxygen in the intestinal tract. And then there's some antimicrobial substances like the bacteria sins that uh, some bacteria secrete as a way to outcompete and battle with their closest competitor, competitors. So think through this idea of microbial antagonism and where that fits in. There are a couple other barriers, chemical and mechanical, that don't really fit into one of those first three categories, but they're important innate first-line defenses, so let's think about these. We keep talking about lysozyme. Um, think about where we've seen lysozyme. We saw lysozyme in our sweat. We saw lysozyme um, in the last slide. Where do we see it? In, in nasal secretions, nasal mucus. Turns out there's lysozyme also in our saliva. And then in the tissue fluid, there are interstitial fluids that are bathing our tissues. There's lysozyme as well. So it's pretty nonspecific, always there. Any peptidoglycan can get a hold of it, can attempt to chew it up before the microbes can do any damage. Think about your stomach and the acidity of those gastric fluids. Um, chances are we're taking in microbes with every bite of food and every drink of, of fluid that we take in. That acidity is a, an important first line of defense for those being still there. Uh, the third one is maybe a little less obvious. Iron is a limiting nutrient in most habitats for most microbes. If microbes get into our bloodstream and want to cause a, a sepsis, a bacteremia infection of the bloodstream, they've got to find a source of iron in order to survive. In some cases, what they do is they try to scavenge iron directly from the hemoglobin in our red blood cells. Well, of course, we want that iron, so we have to fight back. We have a set of proteins called transferrins that will try to hold on to any free iron, and they have a relatively strong um, binding capacity for that iron. So really what it is, it's a battle between any microbes that get in our bloodstream and us for the available iron. Um, they can use something called siderophores um, to try to strip iron uh, from, from our, our red blood cells. We can try to hold on to free iron using transferrins. Uh, it really comes down to the binding capacity. So those are some, some interesting and important chemical barriers. And then some important mechanical barriers that are, are obvious when you think about them. Anywhere where there's liquid flushing is going to remove microbes. So removal of pathogens from our tears, right? tears flushing across the surface of our mouth. Saliva, constantly, constantly being produced in our mouths, constantly swallowing and degrading things in our mouths. Urine keeping the, the microbial count in the, uh, the distal urinary tract as low as possible, and then vaginal secretion. So any, any liquids that are being produced in a sort of positive pressure form can act as mechanical barriers. So let's finish this video with a short concept check. Um, think this through. How might taking antacids like Tylenol or Prevacid or something along those lines make you more susceptible to a GI infection? Think through the details of that. Um, and let me know if you have any questions.